Hello everybody, Sagtema here again. Today, instead of a deck showcase, I obviously have to bring you a patch notes breakdown. So today we got the patch notes for patch 3.6 in Legends of Terror, which is a pretty big patch, kind of focusing a lot on the champion and champion changes. Now, I have to be honest with you guys, I, I did see some of the leaks before in the past few days, so this is not going to be my first reaction, uh, but I haven't seen the full list, you know, from Riot itself. So we're going to go through the, down the list, I'm going to give you my initial thoughts, and then after I go through the patch breakdown, I'm going to try to give you guys one deck with each new champion that was changed. So that means we're talking about probably like 13-something decks or more. Uh, so hopefully you guys stay here with me in this video because it might be a long one as we try to showcase all those different decks later on in the stream. Okay, so let's go ahead and go for the patch notes. So this is patch notes 3.6. Um, obviously we have the second anniversary coming up. So cool, cool. You're going to have some nice stuff. Just log in seven days in a row. Um, all right, we're all here for the we're here for the notes, right? This is what we care about. Let's start with the new card. So if you guys don't know, Riot is adding three new cards with this patch. They kind of started this thing where they sometimes they do cat card additions, like we saw last patch. Hopefully, let's make sure, let's hope that this card's a little bit more playable than the ones that we saw last patch. Although I love Desert Duel, don't get me wrong, but the PNC card is like never playable. Okay, so the first one is Might of the Banger. So this is a three mana card from Demacia, slow. To play, spend all your mana, summon a Dauntless Banger, and grow its stats to their amount. If 9 plus mana was spent, grant other ally elites plus 2 plus 2. So, all this is doing is just summoning a Dauntless Banger. That is just going to be really big, right? So it's going to be like, a, let's say you spend 5 mana, it's going to be a 5-5. Five, five. But if you spend more than nine mana, so we're talking about turn six, right? So turn six, that gives you nine mana. If you if you have three mana, three spell mana saved, then everything gets added plus two plus two. Is that really good? I don't know. I don't think that I don't think this card looks that great. It's almost a unit that gives everything else plus two plus two. Actually, not everything else. It has to be elites. So it doesn't synergize with everything else on the board, only the elites. I don't know. I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't think this card is going to see a lot of play, but we'll see. Let's kind of see how the card looks here, just to make sure that I'm reading it correctly. So you have a 9 mana, he spends 9 mana here, so you get a Dauntless Banger, that's a 9-9, nine, nine, and everything else gets plus 2, plus 2. It's decent, it is a grant, so it is decent, I just think it's a little bit too slow, right? But I might be wrong, might be wrong. We're definitely going to try it out on Elite deck. For Glory, is a 6 mana Reputation at cost 3, summon 2 Traferian Glory Seekers. So if you guys don't know what the Traferian Glory Seeker is, let's just actually start having our Mobalytics open. I don't know why I did this, I have it right here in my favorites. So a Traferian Glory Seeker is the 2 mana 5-1. So let's assume that you're always going to use this when you have Reputation. So for 3 mana slow spells, uh, you are actually summoning two of these. So you're saving one mana. And obviously it's a spell. So you can do at least a spell mana. Um, that's not bad. That's not bad. I think it's a pretty good payoff for once you really have a reputation trigger. So that's pretty darn cool. Let's just take a look right here. Okay, okay. Yep, okay. So it's just summoning two. All right. That's completely fine. All right, so then the last one is Inner Beast. Give an ally plus one plus one this round and create a stand swap in hand. Two mana burst be spell. I think this, if, if it was grand, I feel like it would be a lot better, right? Being give, I think it's a little bit awkward. You're paying, you're pretty much paying five mana for a stand swap. And I don't know if that's worth it. Because think about it, the, the plus one plus one, it might matter in certain scenarios, but I don't think it's ever mattering all that often. So you're talking two mana for a plus one plus one and create another card, but the card that you're creating costs three mana. So you're talking five mana just to do a glorified stand swap. 
I might be wrong, but I don't I don't think this guy's gonna be that great either. He might see some playing some Udir decks as a way to potentially level him up quickly. Because he does synergize with Udir, right? Let's say you don't get the bullpen one there on turn two, but you get this instead. You can play this and then summon Udir and you get a zero cost stand swap. So there is where the benefit comes in. Or you can just use this and attack with Udir, and then you get a zero cost stand. Okay, so actually, okay, so there is some synergy there because of Udir. So maybe it's actually decent. Because it means that you can actually attack with Udir, give it plus one, plus one, and the stance that you create is going to become zero cost after Udir strikes. It might actually be better than I thought, but let's let's continue. So now we go to the meat of the patch, which is going to be the champion changes. So first we start with Ash. So Ash, you frost back four plus enemy, you decrease four enemies at enemy's powers to zero. So at first this looks like a weird change but there are a lot of cards that it can work with so now it can work with stuff like quicksand for example you change you reduce the powers enemy to zero especially because quicksand can target two units and that will be two progress level towards ash towards ash i think this change is huge i don't know if it's going to make ash competitive because she still has a lot of problems of being three health for example um but but it might be enough it might be enough to see her have play in other decks that than, than just uh, Freyly or Noxus, right? So like we talked about, it could be like Freyly Shurima taking advantage of Quicksand, Exhaust, Desert Duel. Like Shurima has a lot of cards that reduce the opponent's attack. And you might actually see some fun Ash Shurima decks. So I think this that, this change is really nice. It's a nice buff. Darius, I see enemies Nexus has 10 health or less. I see the enemy Nexus has half its standing health. So yeah, so this this change doesn't really matter. This is more for Path of Champions, because um, it's the same thing, right? In a regular match, 10 nets of self or half is gonna be the same, unless in the future, you have a way to increase nets of self, but I don't know how that will work here. Galio goes from a 0 9 to a 0 10. I don't think this solves the issues that Galio has. Um, I think there's other issues that are preventing Galio from being playable. But the additional stat is never a bad thing, right? It is a nice buff. I uh, will allow him to survive a little bit longer, although the ha Darius Galio doesn't really have that problem. So I don't think this is going to make a lot of change either. But, you know, we'll see. More, more health is always nice, I guess, because he technically is also more attack. So this is this technically ends up being a plus one, plus one buff. So, Garen. Run, start, rally. Okay, so that's... So when I'm summoning, give... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on. Level one has run star rally. This doesn't make sense, right? This has to be wrong because this is not showing. Like I know, I know the guy, I know the level of Garen, I know the level of Garen has this rally ability, but it wouldn't make sense for level one to have it. So I'm assuming that this is wrong. So the change is when I summon, give other allies plus one plus one, as you see in the image here, and then level up stays the same, uh, except that it just gives also plus one plus one. So this is a really good change because elites are really like quickly have a pretty big board. You really have stuff getting buffed with like the Bannerman. So the fact that Garen drops on turn five and can also buff them up by plus one plus one means that your elites are gonna pack a big punch and they're gonna be able to push through. I really like this. I really like this. I think it actually could make Garen a really good card to be used in, in a lot of different decks, right? So. I like it. I like it a lot. Karma. Creating Hannah. So now, now she keeps her level 1 ability. Creating Hannah random spells from your regions when you play a spell. Yeah. So level 2 now gains the level 1 ability where at the end of each turn, you're able to create a random card. I think this is a really good change. Uh, although most Karma decks don't have any problems uh, running out of cards in the late game because you have usually have another Karma and you can just duplicate your spells. It is a very nice change nonetheless, right? You can create a lot of a lot of good stuff um, that that can win you the game, right? So after turn ten, you're still generating a spell every single time. Um, I think it doesn't solve a lot of the karma problems. If you get to turn ten with karma, you're probably already winning the game. But it is a nice little quality of life change. Katarina, level two now creates a zero cost fading blaze edge in hand. Don't think that's gonna be that big of a difference. I might be wrong. Um, I guess, you know, the zero cost fleeting edge will be able to tag a lot of the units that they'll put in my half, allowing you to potentially be able to flock them or play or play Katarina with something like the Nazis Glinthorn card that like stuns all damaged enemies. So there is some synergies here, 
I just don't know if that's what Katarina wanted. Katarina still has the same problem of being like a big mana sink. Because every time she strikes, she's going back to your hand and you need to spend four mana to play her again. So not sure if Katarina is going to really see a lot of difference. But, you know, at least people can try her out and see if there's anything new there. LeBlanc, when I level up and each time I see you, so they made it so that you can create a mirror image on the level. So before you needed to level up LeBlanc and then deal another 15 damage to create a mirror image. But now, as soon as you level up LeBlanc and deal that first 15 damage, she will create a mirror image in hand. This is huge. I think people are underestimating how strong mirror image is, especially with the indecisive tactician. Uh, so that's the, that's the Natsus card that gives rally. This is so good with this card, with the indecisive tactician. Because a lot of times you have to wait until like you did 30 power, which means a lot of times that LeBlanc will die before you get to that point. But now the fact that she triggers right away on level up means that it's more likely than ever for you to actually get the, the uh, mirror's image in your hand. Meaning that you're pretty much going to have a two mana rally once you drop tactician on the field. And I think that's very big and people are underestimating that. So. I think this buff is huge and we'll see LeBlanc see a little bit more play. Obviously her level one still has the problem of only having two HP. So we'll see how that shapes out. Leona, level two gains overwhelm. It's a nice change, it's a nice buff. I just don't see how it's gonna make a lot of difference. Um, because I don't see Leona as a unit that gets that big, right? She only has four attack. I guess it makes it so that chump blockers don't really stop her. You actually can still push a little bit more damage, but I don't think it's gonna be too big, but again, it's a nice change, so it's nothing bad. Malphite, new effect. When you play Malphite, you stun an enemy. I think this is really big as well, and a really nice buff to Malphite. So playing Malphite on the defensive turn when your opponent has the attack turn is now really, really good. Because a lot of times, you did not want to play Malphite and spend seven mana and then tap yourself out of any response and opponent potentially be able to beat you, right? Now, at least you can use the Malphite and stun one of the opponent's units. So even if you're still using seven mana, at least you don't feel like you're completely tapping out of everything. Like there were a lot of times where you couldn't play Malphite because you were just, you had to hold the mana to do a stun, for example. Uh, but now you don't have to do that. Right? You can just play the Malphite and it's stun right off the bat. And yeah, I think, I think this is a really good buff, really good buff. And I think uh, a certain player, Grandpa Roger, is going to be very happy with this change. So expect a lot of Talia Malphite to pop off on him. Natsus gets fearsome back on level one. This is great. Now, granted, compared to last year where you had like Natsus Trash, there's a lot more counters to it right now, right? Yeah, you have stuff like Minimorph, you have stuff like the new Quicksand, being able to target two units, right? So, so there's a lot of ways to avoid getting hit by a fearsome Natsus. But this is still a really good change. And I think it makes Trash Natsus a pretty good deck again. Uh, because now, you know, when Trash summons the Nasus, the Nasus is not getting chump blocked by just anything. So you can create some pretty funny scenarios. Um, I can see Nasus being very playable again, now that he can actually push damage, even when he doesn't level up. Nocturne. When you play a unit, uh, when you summon a unit, it gives enemies minus one this one. So instead of play, now it's a summon effect. This doesn't make a lot of sense with Nightfall, because a lot of the Nightfall cards are play effects. Uh, you don't really have a lot of cards that are summoning. Uh, on, on the Nightfall, but it gives Nocturne some flexibility with some certain cards. Like, let's say like you can play, you can play Nocturne with um, the, the Burst Piece spells that summon the Mistwraith, right? Now, you are gonna have a harder time leveling up Nocturne in a deck like that. So you kind of have to find a way to mix it. Another funny thing is just playing Nightfall and just adding like double harrowing to the deck because Nocturne tends to be your strongest card in the Nightfall cards, right? So when the Nocturne will get summoned first from the Harrowin and then the rest of the units get summoned, reducing the attack of the opponent's blockers by one by one by one. That's pretty cheeky as well. I might try that out with Harrowin. So yeah, but Nocturne, is, it's an interesting change. I just don't know how much it's actually, actually going to do, right? Scion is going to go back one more attack. So if you guys remember, this used to be a 10 sits, got nerfed to an 8 sits. Now it's back to a 9 sits. So now it's like a middle ground. I think this is pretty good. Uh, that is the point of overwhelm could make the difference between you being one of lethal and actually having it sat lethal, right? Uh, so I think it's a really good change that's going to be enjoyed by a lot of the discard, uh, the discard silent decks, right? So I, I, I like it. I like it. It's a, it's a nice little middle ground. Udyr. 
So instead of leveling when you damage the Neto seven times, now it's going to level when you do three stand swaps. And his stats are now 5-4 instead of 4-4. Four, four. The stats doesn't matter. I think the attack stats don't really matter that much. It might matter though later on, right? But the stand swap level up is amazing. I think now you can actually reliably level up Udyr almost every single game, which is huge. Because remember, level up Udyr gets plus one, plus one, each stand swap that you have used this game so if you drop level up if you if you drop Udyr leveled up he's already gonna come down as a 9-8 nine, 9-8 eight. Nine, eight, a 5 mana 9-8 people are underrating how big of a difference that is especially because then from there on your Udyr you can give a regeneration you can give an overwhelm and you can start just making this this car like a big tank that the opponent has to deal with at the same time though we still have some of the same problems as we had before. It's really vulnerable to hard removal. So stuff like Scorch Earth, stuff like Vengeance. Because you are required to attack as well, you're also vulnerable to a lot of uh, burst speed combat tricks, right? So if your opponent can buff the unit, they can just kill your Udyr during the attack. So just be careful of that. But I do think Udyr is really good right now and could be a staple in a lot of failure decks just because of how big he can easily get once he's able to level up. Vladimir gets fearsome on level one and level two, right? So it's pretty nice. It means that Vladimir will not be chump block. So now the opponent is going to have to commit a three attack unit or, or, or more to be able to block him. Uh, so now, you know, they, they are forced to do something to block Vladimir, which is pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Um, don't know if it fixes a lot of the problems that Vladimir has, but it should allow him to see some plays, some more play. Uh, especially with some of the other buffs that you're going to see later on. So, Follower, Spells, and Landmark. Ambush goes from 2 cost to 3 cost. I think this is a huge nerf. Um, the card is still very good, don't get me wrong. Uh, but there's a lot of times, as you guys saw, we like to play a lot of Victor Lee. There's a lot of times where that mana, that one mana could make a big difference, right? Uh, so, it is a significant nerf. It will still allow the card to be useful. But it's not like the car is like a free win condition anymore. So just keep that in mind. Ballistic Bobby goes from a 1 3 to a 0 3. I think this is an excellent change. Um, it's a good, healthy change that doesn't completely destroy Ballistic Bob. Because remember, he has the Ugman. So even though it's a 0 3, he can quickly become a 3 3, for example, right? Uh, especially if you have a big turn in the field, he can quickly get back out of control. Uh, but now that he has zero attack, it does make him a worse blocker into aggro decks. So it's giving the opponent and more chances to be able to punish the players that play Ballistic Bot. So I think it's a great, great change. Block for Blood goes from fast to burst. This change might not be make the card amazing, but I think it's a really, really good change that will allow for some really fun stuff. Um, like, I, I don't know, like th this change looks crazy to me. Like you can burst speed I mean, you could already do that. You could already burst the level of Vladimir because of the uh, the two mana spell, right? That that damages one unit and gets plus two, plus two to the other. But this will allow you to safely, with a burst piece uh, ability, trigger the uh, the three drop three three from from Vladimir's package, right? Be able to create another unit right there for two mana while also tagging him. Is that worth? I don't know, uh, but I think it is a nice quality of life change to make this burst speed. I still don't know though if it's worth the two mana. So we'll see. Barry Sundis. When I add send the ally levels up, it only advances the, the Sundis nine rounds. So before it used to advance it at 10 rounds, now it goes to nine. This means that instead of triggering the Sundis on turn six, the earliest you can do it is turn eight. Except Shurima has a lot of cards that can reduce the cooldown of the, of the Sundis. So I actually think a really good card that we could still see in play in Shurima. Oh, look at that. The Crimson Curator is the card that I was talking about just now when we were talking about Blood for Blood. But the card that I wanted to talk about right now is the Clockwork Curator. Clockwork Curator is a two-mana card from Shurima that advances an ally landmark two rounds, which is just the exact amount that just got nerfed in the Sundus. You could probably replace one of your two jobs, like Bomber Twins, on a Sundus deck and just play this instead. So that you're still reliably triggering the Sundays on turn six or seven instead of waiting all the way to turn eight. Because triggering on turn eight can be a big difference between you losing to control and you'll be able to win the control matchup. So I think Mono Shroom is still going to be really good. This is a nice change to slow it down. We'll see if he actually ends up making a huge difference. 
Bone Crusher. So this was a four mana six four that when you did reputation cost two. So now when you have reputation, it costs three, which is kind of like a nerf, but it gets overwhelm instead, which I think is pretty nice. Um, a six, a three mana six four with overwhelm, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. I like it. It can be a good finisher in some reputation decks that might just struggle to find those last pieces of, of damage that they need. Right, so especially with the four health, she might sit back for at least one or two attacks, right? So, so yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Hiara Oseer. So this card got changed so that instead of creating a stand swap in hand, uh, now she will create a stand swap in hand instead. But instead of the stand swap costing zero, now the first stance you play each round is gonna cost zero, which I think is very very good. It's a pretty good engine. So. It means that after after the first initial turn, every single stance up after that, at least the first one in each run is gonna cost zero. So it can get really it can get out of control really quickly if the opponent doesn't remove this all seer right away. Um I think it's a really good buff, and I can see her making a lot of play in some of the uh frailier decks we do there. Now the question is that I don't know if you can play this card plus the shaman skull in the same, because I feel like they contradict each other, right? Shaman skull creates two stance up that cost zero zero. Um, so I think you have to kind of decide which one of these to play. But I really like this change. I think this guy's going to be really good. Lancer becomes an elite, which is amazing. It means that if you have the Battlesmith on the field, this card becomes this card becomes a 6-5. Six 6-5 five. Six five Challenger is pretty darn good, especially because it gives you another elite in hand after this one dies. So I definitely, definitely like this change. The only problem is that it costs 5 mana. So it might conflict with Garen because Garen is also 5 mana. And you definitely don't want to replace like your six drops, so you might end up with too many high drop units. So we'll see. Bando tree, it goes from five cost to four cost, and now it needs to be I have seen. So it's kind of like Star Spray. So the Bando tree needs to see you play 10 cards from different regions. Or summon, actually. Summon 10 cards from different regions. This nerf kills the card. I think they should have made it lower cost like you know how stars is two mana if they were going to do this change and make it i have seen it needed to be three or even two costs because bando tree has a lot of low cost units that they want to play early on to be able to survive this is forcing them to have to wait to play them until after turn four and i don't think that's worth it for any deck any bando tree deck so i don't expect this card to really be meta anymore after this uh, then we're going to do the Bangor Squire, which just gets cost reduced from 4 to 3. So another another buff to Elites. Uh, it can be pretty good because sometimes it was a little bit aqua at 4 cost. So yeah, that's that's a, that's pretty amazing. Yodelin Arms gets nerfed from giving allies plus 3 plus 3. I mean, sorry. Before it used to get plus 4 plus 4. Now it gets plus 3 plus 3. It's a pretty good nerf. I still think the card is really darn good. A 5 mana plus 3 plus 3. Is amazing, right? Think about for uh, think about for the Masia. For the Masia is a six mana uh, that gets plus three plus three, and it still sees some play. So I think this makes it more in line with for the Masia. Um, I, I like it. I like the nerf. I like the nerf. Jordan in arms can still be pretty strong, but not to the level that it was before, where you're just dying right away when they put in those their first uh, Jordan in arms. So yeah, and then. Aside from card updates, we're getting some very good, some very big game rule updates to the game. So, who? The first one. Burst Pass. Burst Pass is gone. So, what we mean by Burst Pass is that sometimes before, let's say you have the attack token, you could use something like Time Trick, and then you pass to see what the opponent will do. That's not the case anymore. If you do Time Trick and you pass, the opponent can actually end the turn before they couldn't. Before they will have to pass and it goes back to you, right? Now they can just end the turn on the spot, which might not be a big deal on the higher level of plays, but it does make a big deal on the lower, I guess, level of plays. So this used to be like a I guess a skill check, if you want to call it that. Because players, especially like high master players, will do like a burst pass. And if the opponent commits their mana on doing something, then they will do something else in response, right? So let's let's think about this. When I play Victor Lee, for example, let's say the opponent has four mana and I have six mana. I play Time Trick first and I keep the Victor in my hand because I want to make sure that the opponent taps out of the four mana because I don't want to die to like a thermogenic beam. 
I do the time trick, I burst pass, and the opponent will wait. Bad, bad players will actually tap out of the four mana there and commit a unit, allowing me to play my big toe for free. Good players will have kept their four mana so that I will never be able to play the big toe. You can't do that anymore. Now you have to commit the big toe right away or just risk the opponent just passing back and ending the turn. Um, so you can't do burst pass to kind of check what the opponent might have anymore. Uh, again, don't think it matters to the highest level of plays. I think now it just means that you have to do your skills when you need to, but it does kind of make a difference when you have some of the, some of the platinum diamond and low master players playing against each other. The other big change that was made was um, changing casting, right? So before you had a lot of cards that said cast, and that way they on, their effects only trigger when the card was actually resolved on the field. So think of like Nami. Nami will buff your units. If you play Mystic Show when you have an enemy in the field, she will only buff the, your ally after the Mystic Show resolves. They got rid of that. So now they combine that we play, meaning that the Nami effect will actually happen right away as soon as you put that card on the stack and click OK. That is huge. And it's a secret buff to so many things that people are not realizing. Like this alone is the biggest change in this whole patch wow so cars cast cards have been adjusted to activate when you play a card targeting now activates when you play a card as well so targeting and cast both activate whenever you play the card 61 cards in total are affected by this this tells you how big this is the vast majority of these are card buffs with some slight tweaks and a few nerves yeah most of them are card buffs i i, I it is it's, it's whatever a lot of these are card buffs. I'm going to tell you why. And I'm going to pull it up right here on Mobile Linux, the different cards that get affected with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in order to kind of showcase how much this makes a difference, let's kind of look at cards that have cast in their current wording, right? So let's look at the Mage, Mage, Mage Seeker Persuaders, right? So all the Mage Seekers, once you have cast a Cisco spell, uh, you give, you know, they get the challenger, they get the stats, right? Now with this change, the spell doesn't need to resolve. So you could literally, like even if the spell gets denied, you still get the value here of the persuaders. Any mage sweet, any mage seeker, sorry, still gets their stat value right away. the way. Same thing with Starlight here. If you play a Mystic Shot, it gets triggered right away. It doesn't have to wait for the Mystic Shot to get an Amplify. One of the biggest buff is going to be Ezreal. So before people could use Mystic Shot on the Nexus and you could kill the Ezreal to stop the Mystic Shot from doing, uh, from triggering the Ezreal proc, you can't do that anymore. As soon as the opponent can miss the Mystic Shot on the stack, Ezreal is doing one damage to your Nexus right away. Or two damage in case that the opponent is targeting an enemy Nexus. That's huge. Hashtag Handler, same thing. It doesn't need to see this. It doesn't need to see the, the spell resolve. It just needs to see a play. So even if the spell gets denied, the Hester Candle right off the bat becomes a 4-3 and gives every tech plus one plus one. This is huge because a lot of times you can counter the Hester Candler by doing a Mystic Shot on it before the set's got spell resolve. Can't do that anymore. Nami, we kind of talked about, now she's buffing the units right away when you play it, which is really good with the elusives. You can like literally commit all your elusives and commit all your face burn to the face and attack at the same time. Um, works with peddler so now peddler doesn't need to see cards resolve actually works with the approach of tomorrow as well so right away you get your mana back even if the even if the spell gets denied of course works with jace you can no longer deny the jace level up so let's say you have a jace on the field and he's a one out of two opponent plays a six mana slow spell before you will be before you will have been able to bend against the jace to stop the level up now you can do that jace levels up right on the spot and we're coming up to the two cards that I think see the biggest buff from this. So the two cards that I think see the biggest buff from this are Heimerdinger and Lutz. Heimerdinger is used to be create a turret when you cast a spell, meaning that he needed to wait for the spell to resolve. Now, as soon as you put that, sp that spell on the stack, Heimer creates a turret. Meaning that even if you kill the Heimer, as that spell is on the stack, you no longer deny that turret creation. And that's humongous. Humongous. I'm so excited to see Heimer. 
see a lot of play because I think that change can be a big deal and it's such a huge counter to stuff like Vengeance or even many more, right? And then Lutz is the same way. Lutz will level up and Lutz will create a laser even if the spell gets denied, even if Lutz gets removed from the field. So you could counter Lutz before by doing, you know, concerted benches, etc. stop the spell from being created. No longer the case. Lutz will create that spell and that's huge. That's going to make a big difference. So I think really Heimer, Lutz, and Jace see some of the biggest buzz from this. Obviously Astrid as well and Nami. Uh, Fist, right? We didn't touch about Fist, but now Fist doesn't need to wait for the spell to resolve. So literally, let's say that you don't have any burst piece spells in your hand. You can just uh, have the have the Fist attacking and play Mystic Shot to face. And if Fist still gets the, the Elusive right at the back. Same thing with Lee Sin. You no longer have to hope that you have a burst speed in your hand. You can use a pass fee spell as well and be able to still get a challenger and be able to get the leasing kick. This is huge, huge, huge. And there's a lot of cards that I'm missing that I'm not going to go through. Um, especially Jace Lutz looks really, 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 really scary. Jace Lutz was really a really big, decent mid-range deck. And I'm sure Davo is out there happy, praying to the Riot Gats that they gave him this buff. Because I think this card, this combination is going to be crazy. Woo! Yeah, 30 minutes of us talking to the patch non-stop. My voice is shot. Uh, this is going to be a long video because I said, I'm going to give you guys a deck, every single one of the champions that we see out there. So you can sit through this or not. The other rest of the patch is just kind of visual upgrades. Let's kind of take a look at that. Let's see how this looks. I actually haven't seen this. So, you get like a little gem here telling you that her just created an action. And then this is telling you that you can attack, I guess. So, it's just a lot of, a lot more visual updates to make stuff clearer. Um, cool, cool. This is showing that these cards are getting hit. Okay. It's just a bunch of different visual updates that we really don't care about that much, to be honest. A stat parry, attack blocker indicators. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's fine. Um... Then we get some free skins. If you guys have not seen this, because of the two-year anniversary, we get some free Arcane skins. So you have Vi here and Vi here. By the way, if you guys have not seen Arcane, watch the show. It's freaking amazing. And you also get Arcane Jeans right here as well. Okay. That's pretty good. You get alternate R for a lot of skins. So, okay. Okay. So there is a lot of the arts for the spells, like the champion spells, right? A lot of the alternate, alternate spell card art to that. Okay, yeah, yeah. I still don't think skins are worth buying. I think they're rip up in this game. Uh, don't buy them, in my opinion. Everything else, like the emotes and the and the uh, little animal. The, well, I guess the uh, shoot. Yeah, you you know what I'm trying to say. The, the you know the pearls, etc. All it all awesome. But I think the skins are not enough value for what they actually do. So, emotes, see this look? Oh, that's a nice one. That's a nice one. That's a nice one. <laughs> Card back, we get Chip. Chip, birthday, turning two. This is cute. Okay. I can find, find. Buck fixes. Nothing really that affects. Nothing really that affects gameplay that much, right? I guess spell shield blocking despair is pretty good. But aside from that, yeah, okay. So I think that's gonna be it for the patch notes. Again, um, the, the, the change to cast works, the change to Ash and the change to Uther are the three changes that I'm most excited about that I think will completely change the meta on its head. So anyways, let's move on to give you guys at least one deck with each of the champions that was touched today. Hope you bear with me because it's gonna be a long one. See you all in a little bit. So here's my version of Ash Shurima, which I think could be a very interesting deck because of the changes to Ash, where now she will level up when you set an opponent's unit's attack down to zero, which means that now she can synergize with things like Exhaust, which reduce the enemy by minus two, things like Desert Duel, same thing, minus two, and Quicksand, which does minus four or minus two into two enemies. Obviously, it does mean you're gonna have to target units that have two or less attack, uh, but I think it still has a very good potential of, of being able to kind of turbo level Ash and allow your units to just push so much damage. So this version of Ash with Shurima is also kind of trying to take advantage of a lot of the vulnerable tools from Shurima 
to be able to pull the opponent's strongest units while they're frozen, right? So we are playing stuff like Rock Hopper. We're playing stuff like Merciless Hunter. And like we talked about, Exhaust. All these cards allow us to kind of just be able to pull the opponent's units, especially if they're frozen, to be able to kill them for free and get favorable trades. The rest of the deck is kind of built around cards that give a lot of values. So obviously, we have Ash, which can now potentially turbo level faster. Renekton is just there to, again, take advantage of the vulnerable, right? Uh, probably need to zoom in on this, to be honest. Yeah, I think that should be fine. So this is helping you guys take advantage of the vulnerable um, and be able to pull and level up Renekton quickly. Two Perseverance, because we do lack some draw here. But Kai Reaper, Fearsome can get through, especially because you're freezing a lot of units with Ash. Same thing with the Merciless Hunter, both Fearsome and puts Vulnerable. Treasure Seeker just is a really great unit. And her Walking Sands can also synergize with Vulnerable. Ice Spell Archer to level up Ash. Um, Rock Hopper, again, Vulnerable. Wolf, Ranfire Wolf is actually a funny tech here because you can reduce the opponent's attack to zero with a lot of these other spells that you have, right? Um, so it can get a pretty good number of trades. Uh, one Jerk to be able to guarantee that we draw Ash is the only pool that we have in our deck, right? That has five or plus five or more power. Uh, and even if we haven't really have an Ash in the field, it's not a bad pool because it will draw us into a Flash Freeze. Uh, two Brittle to Freeze, two Exhaust to reduce and pool. Troll Shan. Actually, also synergizes with Ash now. I forgot to mention that by setting the opponent's attack to zero. That's a dual flash freeze, quicksand, and then one round of negation to protect against any shenanigans that the opponent might have. So, this is my version of Ash Renekt. I have Ash Shurima. I ended up selling for Renekton as the second champion. Uh, it's debatable if he's actually going to be the best one or not. But ideally, you're finishing the game by attack with a level up Ash and be able to just push damage with all the rest of your units. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed this deck, and I'll see you all for the next one. So this one is going to be NASA Stretch. So obviously, a lot of you are familiar with this deck already. Um, the idea with this deck is that you're able to summon up NASA's, cheat on NASA's by playing Trash, and be able to develop Trash quickly because of the other tools that you have from, from Shadow Owls that are able to let you kill your own units. Because killing your own units also counts as late triggers, which will allow you to get your NASA's bigger and bigger. So in this deck list, obviously three, tra three trash, three NASA's is the standard. I do like playing three bushy because it synergizes so well with Curse Keeper. And it can also be used with stuff like the Fading Icon to be able to get rid of the prey. Uh, and you can also even use it on stuff like Treasure Seeker if you need to, right? But Kai Reaper is so good because he's going to get bigger and bigger. And he has Fearsome. Treasure Seeker is just a really good one drop, right? Fading Icon and Curse Keeper are pretty good. Caretaker can also synergize with the Icon as well as Curse Keeper. And the challenges for the Caretaker can pull away the Fearsome Blockers to allow your Merciless Hunter, your Nasus, or your Bakai Reaper to get through damage uninterrupted. Merciless Hunter is just so good as a Fearsome at Attacker, right? And a Fearsome Puller. Spirit Switch is just a little bit more draw. And then our spells are just things that either kill the opponents or are able to draw us a little bit more cards or stop the opponent from kind of killing us. So Rider Calling lets us draw one of our champions a lot of times and he synergizes with Curse Keeper or Fading Icon. Glimpse, obviously, pretty straightforward. Draw and he slays one of our units. Balfies to stall out the game. Black Spear. We kill a lot of our own units with like Butcher. So Spears can be really good at removing a lot of stuff that's currently in the meta. So think of like stuff like Victor. It will get hit by a Black Spear and be able to kill out of the wet bat. Two Quicksand because Quicksand is busted. Two Rider Negation to stop any Vengeance in action and against. Now that Vengeance is its mana. And then I do only like one Atrocity uh, because I think with Nasus having Fearsome on level one, it's very likely that you can just finish by just attacking like that in general without needing to have the atrocity to finish up. And if you do need it, you can always draw into it. But I definitely never want to have two atrocities in my hand. I want this to just be a finisher and nothing else. Uh, so yeah, so this is my version of NASA Stretch. Uh, let me know what you think about it. So for my version of Katarina, this is kind of what I'm going for. I'm going for a Katarina Yasuo Full Copium deck. So this deck is kind of Again, it's not playing two Katarinas because we usually don't want to have two Katarinas in our hand, but at least it plays two. Obviously, Katarina synergizes with Yasuo because every time the Katarina recalls, it's a another progress to Yasuo's level up. Uh, but aside from that, the level two new ability of Katarina, which is able to give you a zero cost fleet, fleet, uh, a fleeting blaze edge, will enable stuff like Ravenous Flock, and it will also enable stuff like our Glinghorn. 
So now all the units are going to be damaged, allowing you to completely stun all damaged units when you attack, which synergizes with Yasuo to potentially just completely bulk clear, bulk clear the opponent's board, right? So aside from that, we play Blaze Twirler because it's going to get really big, House Spider to allow us to stall early on, Sentries to stun. I also, aside from just relying on Yasuo, I also want to be able to have an alternate win condition where I can actually take advantage of the Katarina Rally, and that's where you have the Legion Maruders here. And the Maruders also, I think, synergize with Glenhor because Glenhor is able to just stun all the blockers that could potentially do something to stop the Maruders. So the Maruders are able to synergize. We also play Strength Engine Numbers to be able to do that. Uh, General is just going to be a really good fearsome card that can be a big finisher. Uh, two Reckoners, the same guess with Yasuo, Glenhor we already talked about. You're able to damage opponent's units with Katarina's Blaze Edge or stuff like Death Lotus, which you play two of. Uh, one Nopo Fight to defend. Guillotine as a way to kill a lot of damaged units. Scorch Earth, same thing. Three Concussive Palms, uh, two Denies, one Chompo to Rally because we're only playing two Katarinas. I think it's worth it to have one more. This also damages the unit, again, setting up for a flock. Setting up for score share, guillotine, or setting up the glimmer, and then we type out the strength number. So, this is a pretty high hopes list. Don't know if it's actually going to be good, but this is what I think about when I'm thinking Katarina giving a zero cost place edge. I want to be able to synergize it with cards that want, to, that want the opponent's unit to be damaged, right? And the first one that jumped on me was Glenhor. So, yeah. Give this a shot and let me know if this actually works for you. I'll probably play a, a game or two just to test it out myself once the patch drops. But yeah, see you for the next deck. So for Nocturne, obviously the change for Nocturne is that now if you summon a unit, it will reduce, uh, I guess, minus one, right, to the enemy units. The only way that I can see this working in micro decks is by including heroin in the deck. So it makes me think of like, if you guys remember like Darius heroin back from I guess two years ago, I go now, where you used to play just a bunch of aggressive units and then just kind of finish the game with a harrowing. That's what I think of here. Now, the only downside for this is that you're not getting a big, a lot of big units and a lot of the effects from your Nightfall cards are not going to trigger when you summon them for harrowing, but they will all have fearsome because Nocturne. So let's say your Nocturne dies. You're able to do harrowing. Nocturne should be able to get summoned first, right? And then every sub subsequent unit that gets summoned will be able to trigger the, the, the level of Nocturne ability to reduce the opponent's attack by one, allowing all your units to get through. So even though technically these units don't have a lot of attack power, they're able to push damage just because of the fearsome, similar to how in the Darius Overwhelm deck, you used to be able to push damage just because all your units have Overwhelm. So I think this is my approach. My approach is just a simple Nightfall deck that just finishes off with Harrowing in case that you get into a tight spot, right? So how many times have you played Nightfall? You run out of resources and you're like, oh, that's it. Well, everyone comes to your rescue. So yeah, I think this is what I would do. It Like I can't think of anything else that could take advantage of the Nocturne level up uh, and the change ability. So yeah, let's see what comes next. So for Leona now, I have something a hard time thinking of what to do with Leona. Uh, Leona is a great card, don't get me wrong, but I do feel like she can be a little bit awkward to play sometimes. So I ended up settling for like a Leona beatdown deck, so kind of like a Daybreak Demacia deck, where I'm just playing a bunch of Daybreak units, and I try to finish with like a big Rally and a big Morning Light, right? So you can you, either, you play one Morning Light here, you have a chance of getting Morning Light from Raboon, and you can obviously get Morning Light from having a second Leona in your hand. The Morning Light will able to buff all your units plus two plus two, also will stun like a couple of the units of their board, and will actually make Leona have at least six attack, which synergizes with her now having Overwhelm. Um, so pretty much you're playing for Tiger, we're playing all this, all the Daybreak cards. So three Leona, three Soldiers, three Shield Bearers, three Sunhawks, three Sun Forgers, just because he has such a good attack stat, uh, that if he can get through, he can push a lot of damage. And then obviously three Raboons, just as a way to get a lot of value because we have Leona in the field. Uh, and then with the one morning light, right? And then for the master, we just play a lot of nice value units. So stuff like Garen, Broadwind, Triple Surgeon as another way to potentially get like for the Masia, the Sinning Yes with like a big rally, or you being able to stun the field really early. Um, sharp side to protect, single combat as you know. Uh, we have a lot of thick units, especially Garen. Uh, two concerted strikes, three golden edges just for the big combo turn. So I'm pretty much playing this deck as if it was like a Yoru in Arms deck 
where I'm waiting for the big combo turn with for Demacia or Morning Light, and then combining with like a Golden Ages, uh, while also taking advantage of the fact that you're getting rid of the, a lot of the blockers from the opponent by being able to stun them cons consistently. So not very creative, but I really couldn't think of anything else to try with Leona. So again, give this deck a try and kind of see if you like it or not, and let me know how it works out for you. I'll see you for the next one coming up now. So for Cyan, I wanted to bring you guys a test at a deck, sorry, that I've been testing around a little bit. So this is Cyan, Rumble, Papercraft, Dragon, just Overwhelm. Now, technically, Cyan's main role in this deck is to give Rumble Overwhelm, because remember, if you discard the Cyan, it's gonna give you the strongest unit Overwhelm. So that way, by discarding Cyan as one of your units, you're able to have a Rumble that has Impact, Quick Attack, Spell Shield, and Overwhelm right off the back. Then you put Papercraft Dragon on that Rumble and you just win the game. However, with Sion being buffed back now to 9 attack, Sion serves as an alternate win condition as well in case that you're not able to get your combo off. So this Bandos City Nazis deck is just relying a lot on your, on your Mech Yoros, uh, but it has a lot of other ways to finish in case that you don't get there, right? So you have stuff like Grenadier. Uh, Grenadier and the Yoros Squire are there to kind of give you Discard Fodder. Right, because we're not on PNC, so we don't get access to stuff like Chumpers. Fallen Rider and Lost Soul are more discard fodders. Concologist is just there as a great value engine that could also give you discard fodder. Uh, and then you have your discard. So Rumble wants to discard, Rascal wants to discard, giving you a, a, a Moika Yolo that has Spell Shield. And so it's same thing with the Arena, Arena Promoter wants to discard, right, and giving you something that gets discounted by one. And the Papercraft Dragon, if you ever draw two of them, you can always discard one of them. So that's why it doesn't feel too bad whenever you get two. Uh, and then the rest of the cards are also sent in. More discard from Omega Yodos, Poke Stick for some draw and some damage. Willing Death to be able to protect against some crazy lethals and, and able to level up Rumble in the stack if you need to. Might, just in case that you don't get the Cyan discard with the Rumble, it still lets you push the damage with Rumble, Papercraft plus Might. And then just one Whisper Wars for a little bit more draws. So this deck is kind of more playing more for the Mecha Yodos and the Rumble win condition. So it's kind of taking more advantage of the buffs that the Mecha Yodos got last patch, where a lot of the Mecha Yodos got even better stats. So all of these Mecha, Mecha Yodos that you can summon, that you can create from Rascal Promoter are so good and can completely swing the game around depending on what you get. Uh, combine that with them being able to level up the Rumble and you could potentially level up Rumble right away on like the first attack. Uh, which is pretty crazy. And then Cyan, if worse comes to worse, you can just win with him. One really funny combo is if you get the little uh, the, the little dipper from one of the Rascal, Promoter, or Scraphead, you can do Little Dipper, discard the Cyan, and then that way your Little Dipper has Overwhelm, and when it dies, it just summons a Cyan right back as well. So really fun deck. If, you want, if you're looking for a new deck to try with Cyan, that's not just the standard PNC and Nazis deck. So yeah, here comes the next deck. So, of course, we could not discuss Blad without discussing Skargrand. So, this is my version of Skargrand. So, it's playing Brom, Vladimir, and it's pretty much the standard list. Uh, except that now, obviously, you have a little bit more offensive power by the fact that the Vladimir has Fearsome. And we're also playing Blood for Blood, which is now Burst B, allowing you to combine it with the Curator to be able to get even more units and more unit generation. So even though this deck lacks cards in the draw department, it has a lot of generation because of the curator being able to generate you a lot of different uh, Crimson cards, right? So obviously the big key card here is Scarcrafts. You want to be able to get Scarcrafts so that your units don't get too damaged all the time. The rest of the units are Crimson support units that are able to just do some sort of value uh, from their abilities. So obviously, this, the Disciple is burning the opponent's nexus, the Crimson Curator is creating other cards, the Demolitionist is also creating some more burn. Really, the hope, the main point of the Demolitionist here is to be able to advance the Vladimir uh, level of condition, because his level of condition, when he's leveled up, is just so good. Being able to drain while activating the rest of your cards. Uh, we only play two Ember Maiden because Ember Maiden is bad when you don't have the Sky Grants, so I don't like to play three of it. Tarkas is a nice alternate to Vladimir in case that you don't draw the Vlad. Brianna can be a nice finisher, uh, just in case that you cannot finish with just the burn that you have. And then the spells are pretty standard. Aisha, Aisha and Death Lotus are able to protect you against a lot of blocks while also triggering your value. And then Trollshan is Trollshan. Blood for Blood, like we talked about, can get some value with a lot of these cards. And then 
obviously you have three sisters to be able to stop and freeze any random stuff and gives you the possibility of doing fear of the north to be able to pull something with bomb or to be able to keep your vladimir alive so yeah really fun deck if you're looking for skyguns deck uh not sure if this is the best version of it but it should do pretty well in the meta especially since vladimir can put a little bit more pressure so yeah enjoy so for Garen, we obviously, obviously have to go with Elites because a lot of cards got both with Elites, so we're going to go full in Elites, and I actually think this deck might have a little bit of potential, right? It still suffers from the same issue as before, where it's just a regular beatdown deck, but I think now it has a little bit more tools to contend with, right? Because Garen is buffing the board by plus one, plus one, it gives us a lot of really beefy units that are really going to be buffed up potentially by your Battlesmith. Right, so a lot of our deck is going to be elite. So stuff like Citria, we only pay two Squires. I don't like Squire that much, but I think he makes sense here as a nice one drop. Uh, Defender, I think, is super underrated. I think the fact that he has top is really important. It allows her to swap a lot of damage. Two Redeemers, because we don't have a lot of join this deck. So I definitely like the Redeemer here. Three Surgeon for Demacia. The Swift and Bargain is so good in combination with Battlesmith as well as he's able to actually reduce a squire, right? So a squire now costs three mana. So it's really easy for him to cost zero mana really easy, really quickly and completely overwhelm the opponent board, especially if you can combine him with like a silver, silver wind vanguard. Uh, three bannermen, because of course we want to buff our whole board and make really beefy units. I think the Lancer is just so good. I only play two of because we're playing triple Garen and triple Citra to allow the units to actually be able to push that damage and that fearsome attack is able to get through. Two Rangers result to survive against a lot of the AoE, so like Avalanche. Two single combats for the potential to potentially level up Garen. Uh, instead of Succession, this is actually supposed to be Matter the, Gar Matter the Banger, but Mobilitics doesn't have it yet. So this is going to be the new Elite spell that summons a Dauntless Banger and just buffs the stat up, you know, depending on how much mana you spend. Um, and then I always like one Harrow in my Elite stack. I think... At some point later in down in the game, you might have lost your Garen, you might have lost your Citria, right? You can play Harrowin, and look what happens. Now you summon a Citria that's going to buff all your units plus one, plus one. When Garen gets summoned, he buffs your Citria plus one, plus one, right? You might get a banner, a banner man. This is going to buff everything else plus one, plus one. It slowly can get out of control just how many buffs you can get because of the Harrowin being able to trigger all of these summon effects. So always like that little bit of a splash spice on my elite stack where we just put some hair in there to go to finish the game so this is what i would do to play garen this time around um don't know if it's actually gonna be good right this still struggles like always by the fact that you kind of don't have a lot of interaction and if this if they get rid of the battlesmith your attacks become a little bit worse right because your units are not getting buffed up as much as they could have if you have a battlesmith on the field uh, so it's very reliant on the battlesmith um, I don't think that Fourth Fallen is worth it in this meta because we don't have a lot of Shadow Isles. But if you start seeing a lot of Shadow Isle decks like with Ruination, then for the Masia is definitely worth it. But yeah, stay tuned for the next deck. So we have a Malphite buff, which means that we have to go with Malphite Talia for our suggestion for Malphite. So I think one of the weaknesses of this deck is that once you get to that late turn 7, sometimes you do not want to summon that Malphite because you wanted to keep enough mana for like a Grand Slam, right? To stop the opponent from being able to do lethal to you. Now, when the opponent is in their attack turn, you can just summon Malphite and completely stall out their attack. Boom. And then sets up your Malphite for the next turn, which will be able to start stunning their board and allowing you to get push a lot of damage to the attack. So... This is kind of like the old version that Roger used to play, where he's kind of trying to combine the Soul Spire with Talia to be able to get a big board of like big 5 board rock bears uh, to be able to just put so much pressure on the opponent. The rest of the cards are a lot of support cards with Landmark. Obviously, we have Ship, because Ship is beautiful that we talked about. You always want to play Ship. Um, rock Hopper, Debao is so good. Hero can give us some overwhelm on Malphar Talia, which can be very necessary sometimes. We also play one of Absorber for that reason. So either Hero or the Absorber could give us the overwhelm that will allow us to finish. One inch in Hourglass to save our units against something like Vengeance. Uh, although we also do run two out of negation, but ancient areas can be pre parked sometimes because you can combine it with like a Talia to be able to summon two units in the field, right? So it, it can be pretty cool sometimes. Some of the combos that you can pin, pull off with Hourglass. Uh, Desert Duel is a nice tech. This deck doesn't really have a lot of removal aside for Rod of Arcane. And Desert Duel is kind of nice because obviously Malfa is a pretty big but beefy unit. And he also lets you sacrifice the Debout, which a lot of times you don't care if the Debout dies, because you can set up 
for you to be able to do right of arcane or be able to duplicate it with Talia. You also have the Rock Pierce, which can do a lot of value with the Desert Duel. So I think Desert Duel is so good in this deck as like a single combat S card. Obviously, to Quicksand, to Rider of Arcane, to Rival Earth, things that will turbo level Talia will be able to remove and stop the opponent's win condition. Ground Slam to slow the opponent down and then to Rider Negation to save ourselves against anything. So I think this deck gets a bit more consistent because of the Mouth by but Buff. I keep saying but yeah, Malfa has a big rocky butt. Anyways, I think it should get more consistent with with the Malfa buff. Wow, that was so random of me. Anyways, but yeah. So hope you enjoy some Malfa Talia. And if you want, you know, if you like this deck style, make sure that you follow Grandpa Roy because he's always messing around with this deck. So yeah. So the Galio buff I don't think was that significant. Uh, but I do wanted to showcase this Galio Poppy deck that I can't be seeing running around. So again. You know, with Galio having one more health, it does make him survive a little bit longer if you get to that turn seven. Uh, so it's pretty cool, right? So obviously the whole point of this deck with Poppy is the synergy with Galio that Poppy doesn't matter because the Galio always has, the Galio and the other formidable units always have zero attack, which means that Poppy is always buffing them, right? Even though Poppy's not a two, three, she can still buff them up. So the synergy here comes from the fact that you're playing Petrus's Hound, Sculpture, Broadwin, right? mountain drake which all get buffed with poppy additionally you're also playing the yoro smith which gives all those units quick attack as well because all the units have zero attack meaning that they have less attack than the yoro smith meaning that your broadwing can come down with quick attack to be able to just push so much damage and then we play a lot of the massive tools like click feather bicycle protector to protect our unit protege because the synergist is pretty nice with poppy becomes a 3-5 right uh banger bannerman we are not playing that many bando city uh, actually, Yoro Smith been our only miss from this deck. So Bannerman can be really good to just buff all your units. Um, and then two Rangers result to protect against AoE. Sharp side, because Sharps is great. Even after the nurse, Sharps is so good with Formidable, because he still gives plus two health. And then Golden Ages and Relentless Pursuit to potentially level up the Poppy. So this is more like a Demacia beatdown deck, which is pretty good, because it's playing Galleon Poppy, so you get some of the value from the Formidable cards. So... Um, you know, not a lot to explain here. Just play your units on curve and just attack. Obviously, try to combine it with the Yoro Smith or the Poppy when possible and just get all the value that way. Uh, we don't have a lot of ways to deal with opponents' units aside from our challengers. So just keep that in mind when you're trying to think of how to deal with the opponent's threats. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this deck. Stay, stay soon for the next one. So for Karma, at first I was thinking Karma Astro because obviously change to cast from cast to play actually buffs up Ezreal because the spells that Ezreal does don't get fizzled out if, if, if Ezreal dies. The problem with that is that that change was actually a nerf to cast my Karma Ezreal because even though now Karma triggers the spell twice, it only counts for one spell for Ezreal. So it's actually a nerf to Karma Ezreal. The deck, I think, is pretty much dead. So the only other Karma deck that I could think about was karma trash uh obviously there is karma lots out there as well which might be a consideration because lots got buff but i think there's a better better deck for lots out there so for karma trash is spooky karma so if you're not familiar with this all you're doing is you're stalling stalling using the shadow owl tools and the ionic tools to stall and stall and stall once you get to turn 10 and you pretty much your win condition is just to outvalue your opponent or just to put them to sleep for the rest of the match to be honest because especially now with the new karma level up ability being able to create a, re a card in your hand you're probably never going to run out of value <laughs> if you're in turn 10 you're probably never going to run out of value i can tell you that so the whole idea here again is just you're just stalling 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 removing opponent's threats get to turn 10 or summon karma with trash early on uh, in case that you don't draw karma naturally, and then just be able to kill the opponent by just outballing them and slowly grind them down, grind them down. You're never gonna run out of cards because the second karma just refills your whole hand and it's able to put more karmas into your deck. So you'll never run out of cards. Um, it's just gonna killing them as slow as possible. This deck is probably one of the slowest decks out there to be able to win the game. With the nerf to Mono Shirima, you might actually be able to do okay with this type of deck because you might not be able to see Shurima as often as you saw in the previous patch. Uh, so yeah, so this is my idea when it comes to Karma. If you want to try this out, you can obviously find the deck, deck description below um, where we post the deck link, but yeah. So for Reputation LeBlanc, this is what I will come up with. So 
I posted a reputation video a few weeks ago now, and I think reputation was actually really pretty good as it was before. It was just a little bit accurate in certain matchups. This buff just makes it even better because again, like I talked about, in the sense of attention with the mirror image is just so, so, so freaking good, especially if you have a level up with server. So why have we changed in this deck list? Well, we have adding three bone crushers now because the bone crusher is a cheap unit that's also going to have overwhelm. That's going to be a three cost that has overwhelm with six attack, which is huge. I think it can allow us to push some of the damage that we were missing because a lot of times you can combine her with Sivir for her to have quick attack and survive longer than just one attack, right? And she even has four health. So a lot of times she will survive at least one attack, no matter what. And the rest of our deck is kind of built around getting those reputation procs. So that's why we have to play triple snapper because the snapper is an easy way to trigger reputation triggers if the opponent decides to block them. And they have to block them eventually. Otherwise it's just dealing a lot of two damage, two damage here, two bad damage there. Treasure Seeker gives you the Walking Sands, for example. Uh, Rock Copper giving Voldemort is pretty nice because you can synergize with the Blank and Sivir. Uh, Glory Seeker is just Glory Seeker. Nice way to remove opponent's units. Bakai Sand Spinner, I love it, I love it because it synergizes with the Quick Attack like we talked about. And it can also synergize with all the other cards. Uh, Bone Crochet, we talked about. Booster, I think it's such a good static unit that can potentially give us some nice keyboards into the Sivir or the Blank that is always worth playing this. And then Tactician itself is a reputation card, but obviously you want to play him when he costs six so that you can just rally right away off the bat. And with Mirror Image, rally it again and again and again and again and again. Our support spells, we do like two shape stones because we have to be able to save the black against Mystic Shot. So that at least that gives us an out. That's it, dude. I think it's so good. We do play Bloody Business as well. As you see, we play Trio, but Desidur is also really nice as an additional strike on top of Bloody Business. I like Desidur a lot more than Willing Death in this deck because at least with Desidur, you can do it proactively. You don't have to wait for the opponent to actually attack, allowing you to kill some of the bad road enemies that the opponent might not attack with in fear of the uh, Willing Death. Uh, one might as a way to potentially finish the game because we can put it in Silver and give everything Overwhelm to quick sense quick sense because this guy's just busted to whisper words because it's really easy for us to trigger her and then uh, i know it says ascend the rise here but pretend that this is the new car so this is going to be the new car for glory so we're going to play one off for glory just as a way to potentially push a lot of damage in this deck um uh, like if we trigger it we're able to play two you know some of two glory seekers for the cost of three cost uh three spell mana i think that's going to be huge I think repetition can be really, really fun. Uh, so I'm really excited to see how this deck shapes out now that, the now that the Black can summon a mirror image when she levels up. So yeah, this will be my version of a repetition deck. So like I briefly touched on, this change the cast to play is a big change to Lutz and Jace. And I think it's a huge buff. So of course I had to reach out to my girlfriend, Dable and ask him what his best uh, well, what he was his most recent gay slots list is, and he sent me his list, and he's very close to this. I think I only changed a few a few cards. I added a second portrait tomorrow. Got rid of the concerted strike. Got rid of the remembrance. I added a third shot glass. So the idea with this deck and why the reason why it's so buff right now, in my opinion, because one of the ways that you could counter lots before in the past was that you either remove the lots or you deny the spell, preventing lots from leveling up or getting the laser. This time around, you cannot do that. With the change from cast to play, it means that as soon as you spend your six mana on assembly line or shock blast, even though they're slow speed spells, lots will automatically level up and get the laser. Meaning that even if the opponent kills her or negates one of these slow spells, you still get the laser, which is huge, huge, I tell you. Um, so it's almost impossible to negate the lots laser. As soon as, long as the opponent, as soon as you get an action to do your six man spell, obviously with back to back it doesn't matter because you're always doing this in burst speed, but it makes a big difference with slow speed spells like assembly line and shot blast, which I think is what makes, in my opinion, make shot blast even better now. And I feel like I want to just play three of it and three of assembly line. It makes our slow spells feel so much better in this deck than trying to play like any fast speed spells or any other burst spell. Again, it also works the Fortune Tomorrow. So before you could negate the Fortune Tomorrow from triggering by negating the ability. But now the moment that you use your spell, you already get the three mana refunded. 
Maybe that even if the opponent negates your spell, you still have three mana left to be able to do something else. Because it used to be a big, bl big blow up before where you do like a six mana spell thinking that you get three mana back and then they, then they do a deny and you just don't get your three mana back. So this buff, I think, is huge, huge, huge. It also works with the Persuaders, right? Because um, now opponent cannot miss the shot to try to counter this. Like as soon as you commit the spell, it triggers, right? It also works with Ferrers, uh, because now even if they, even if the spell gets denied, it still counts towards Ferrers' um, cast, right? Ability. Now, the only bad synergy here, though, is that now that Jace, now that Jace doubles the spell, right? So because Jace doubles the spell here, so if we look at Jace, his ability is also cast. Now it becomes play. Because he's actually leveling up the spell, I'm not positive if it works for Lutz anymore. Like, I'm not positive if it, if it gives Lutz two spells. It shouldn't anymore, because it doesn't work like that with Ezreal anymore. Now with Ezreal, when you double up the Karma spell, you're no longer getting two lasers. Uh, you're, no longer, you're, you're no longer getting two triggers with Ezreal. So it should work the same way with Jace. So technically, it was a buff in that now you cannot negate the spell, but it's also a nerf because now... You can actually, um, and I lost this. I lost. I lost the deck code. Doesn't matter because now you can actually just get like so much value, right? So now you can just get so much value from from lots, um, just actually triggering the spell right away, whether she gets removed or not, gets a laser. So I think it's still worth it to lose the double laser potential for you to be able to just get the laser right off the bat as soon as you commit one of your slow speed spells. Uh, there might be some cases where it's better that you get the double lasers, but it might be some cases where it's not better to get the double lasers, and it was better to just trigger the LUTs and level up the LUTs right back. So, yeah, it, it can go either way. But, yeah, so really, really like this deck a lot. Um, I think it has a lot of potential to potentially be tier one, right? So I would definitely recommend you try this deck out if you're a fan of LUTs. I want to see how it works with the cast changes, but, yeah. So for Hammerding, like I talked about, he also gets a pretty good buff, similar to Lutz, where now, as soon as you play your slow or fast speed uh, spells, you automatically get the turret right out of the way. But just like Lutz, Jace becomes a nerf, because now Jace will not will not level up the number of turrets that you see that Jace, that the Hammer is going to create, because Hammer will only create turrets when it's cast, not when, I, when, not when a card... I mean... <sighs> sorry. Hammer will only create uh, turrets when the card is played, right? So he will not create turrets from the copy that Jace will create. So it's a little bit of a nerf in terms of the Jace synergy, but it's a buff because you can start off with stuff like a Vengeance and right away get a 6 max turret. It's a buff because now the Headstake Handler cannot be countered by stuff like Mystic Shot. You can do, you can do the Headstake Handler and right away do a Vengeance and right away the Handler is going to be triggered. So the whole point of this deck with Shadow Isles is that you're using the Headstake Handler in combination with like stuff like vengeance to just be able to overwhelm the opponent just through the turrets that you get from Heimer Digger. So the adapter obviously passes all the keywords to all the turrets. The headstack handler makes sure that your turrets have more than one health to be able to survive. Um, and then you have all this stuff like production search, thermal, vengeance, shock blast, assembly line to trigger six mana turrets and trigger J's. And you have stuff like iter iter improvement to actually copy your handler and make your turrets even bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you have some of the other standard tools like well to protect against aggro, Balf is the same thing, Ferris Wind and Sia to get us, you know, a crazy wind condition that costs us some more. We have a lot of good hits from Shadow Owls and PNC. Uh, and then Forge of Tomorrow just to give us early blockers and also make our, make us a little bit more mana efficient because the Forge will trigger right away as soon as you commit the spell. No longer does it need to wait for the spell to resolve. So. Pretty fun, pretty fun Heimer deck if you have never tried this deck out before. And I think it could be a slightly stronger now that the Heimer doesn't need to stay in the field to be able to summon that first turret right off the bat. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this one and keep a look up for the last deck. Last but not least, I wanted to bring you guys Udyr action. So obviously Udyr got a big buffs, which I think is going to make Udyr a crazy, crazy, crazy win condition. And I think this combination with Shurima giving us access to stuff like Desert Duel, Grappling Hook, which synergizes with the uh, with the stances, uh, Quicksand, Vata Negation, so gives us the deny to protect Udyr against stuff like Vengeance, is one of the best pairings, right? The, the new spell as well, like Inner Beast, can be very good with the Udyr in synergizing, and Trollshan lets us save the Udyr, etc., etc. Uh, I think this deck 
can actually be, be pretty, 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 pretty darn good. Um, because because I really think Uther is going to become such a crazy win condition in this deck. I think it's really easy for us to be able to enable uh, at least two stand swaps very quickly before Uther even comes out on the field. And obviously once he does, you play the third one, boom, he levels up. Action allows us to be able to have some decent number of draw as well as be able to potentially give the Uther spell shield or, you know, draw even more if we need to. Um, this, this, I think, is a really solid base, right? So I posted a video on a deck similar to this before. I just changed a few cards, added the new cards, obviously added the old seer as well, which I think can become a really big value engine. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm really liking this. I'm really, really liking this. I am playing one tower and keep it to protect against, like, aggro decks, but it's possible that I just go to three rock hoppers instead. I'm kind of test testing it out and kind of see how it plays out. But I feel like Uther is going to be pretty good in this meta. I will. I, I mean, I'll be glad to be proven wrong, but I think Uther is going to be very powerful just because of how much of a finisher he can become now that he can level up so quickly and become such a big juggernaut. And having access to this type of tools like denies, a single combat, you know, a, a, a hush, Shurim is just busted, right? Shurim is just busted. And it's so good. It feels so good to be able to use a lot of these spells as you're attacking with Uther. Like, you're almost never afraid to attack with Uther in this deck because it's very likely that you have a Freeze, a Troll Shan, Quicksand, right? A Rod of Negation is protected. Heck, you could even use the Tyrant Keeper in the Uther if you don't have regeneration on him yet. So it can feel really, really good. And I'm kind of starting to like the Inner Beast, the Inner Beast more and more uh, because it would allow Uther to become a 6-5, right? Meaning that he could potentially survive. And if you use him in the same turn that you're attacking with Uther, that stand swap that you get will become zero cost. Uh, so I think it's a lot more powerful than we're actually potentially giving it credit for. Uh, so yeah, really, really, really like this version of the deck. So hope you guys enjoy it as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be it for all the decks for today. Woo. Welcome back, everybody. I talk my ears off today talking about the passionals and then all the decks that we just presented to you all. I hope you enjoy them just as much as I enjoy making a lot of them. Some of them were just kind of copied from previous version of decks. Some of them are made from scratch, like the Katarina deck. Uh, so you have kind of have a mix of both there, so different decks that you can try out. We will definitely be live on Twitch tomorrow at Twitch Sertermoon, where we're going to be streaming the patch. Usually we go live around 5 p.m. Eastern time, so you can catch us there on Wednesday, April 27, if you're not following us yet on Twitch. As always, if you like the content, please make sure to subscribe below and like the video. It will help us out a lot. And you can also find us on Discord and Twitter. The links to those are both in the description below. All the decks that we showcase today are going to be in the description below. The links to Mobilitics. So go ahead and take a look at them and, you know, see whatever you like from there. Pick whatever you like and try it out. Anyways, see you all again tomorrow as we stream the new patch and also make a new YouTube video on the new patch. As always, same time, same day, all the time. I'm exhausted. I need some water. That was a lot of talking. Why did I commit to presenting 15 different decks? I will never know, but I hope that you guys enjoy the 15 different decks that we showcase today, even, even if briefly. So yeah, have a good time out there in winter.